Thank you very much for uh, taking the time on this rainy day to come here for the presentation. A huge thanks to Sergey for helping to put together this event. Uh, it wouldn't be happening without, without your support, Sergey. Thank you so much. And uh, well, thank you everyone as well for participating and people online. So without much ado, because time has gone by. So today we'll be talking about law and the governance of potential ecosystem collapse. So my name is Dr. Kennedy Neva. I'm currently a research associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk uh, here at Cambridge. And my research looks at the global governance of catastrophic risk, focusing on climate change and the global economy. But I'm very pleased here today uh, to welcome a visiting scholar, uh, Dr. Ruben Makovari, okay. from the University of the Sea. the bag. <laughs> <laughs> so I was introducing him and not his bag. <laughs> so Ruben uh, is visiting us here at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, and he's uh, the university associate at the University of Tasmania, Faculty of Law, where he's, uh, and he's also the Africa Program Lead of uh, Policy and Legal Research Fellow at the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification. And he has experience in research, international diplomacy, law, and policy. And uh, his research, kind of rather his experience, spans across Kenya, Australia, China, but also uh, looking at the global and international dimensions. So he's very accomplished, so I won't go through everything he's done, uh, but uh, today I will get an opportunity to hear part of his research, uh, which is also current of the type of his work in diplomacy, his work in policy, and kind of uh, bringing it all together and kind of also pointing us uh, where to next. So without much ado, uh, Ruben will kind of uh, take it up, but also just a few words in terms of uh, how we get this going. If you're online and you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, just in case we have, it would have been nice for you to ask the questions, uh, but you might have some IT limitations. So please put your questions or comments in the chat. If you're here, of course, you'll get a chance to ask. So for the next 15 minutes or so, uh, Ruben will give us a presentation, and then from there we'll open for a round of questions. So over to you, uh, Ruben. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so grateful to be here today. Uh, it's always good to start with technical difficulties that means you're doing the right things. Um, again, thank you, Sadi, for your help. Of course, I appreciate um, Dr. Ken. Um, you know, it's always a privilege to speak to such a distinguished uh, audience, not just here, but also online. Um, it's something that doesn't look that very often. Um, and when it does, I take note of that. And so thank you for your time. And, and your patience as well. Um, so, as you heard, um, my name is Ruben, I'm based at the University of Tasmania, um, and my research slash uh, sort of technical policy work covers uh, climate ocean change, developmental governance, um, and design of law and policy across, you know, international, regional, and national scales, um, and diplomacy. Uh, so negotiations and those kind of things. Um, and so today I'm going to take you on a, a small little trip. Um, I hope this works. Yep, there we go. Yeah, so it's just a short hop um, across the Mediterranean. Short swim, nice. It's a nice, on a nice day, but probably well, not today. I'll probably get uh, to this spot. So this is the Western Indian Ocean. Um, Fairly really massive region. Um, and there are 10 different states. Uh, so uh, nine of them are uh, basically situated on the African continent. And the one that is not in France uh, because of the reunion islands, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a massive, massive region, not just in terms of geographical scope. I mean, if I can talk that in, um, South Africa, but also it's a region that I'm particularly familiar with because I come from one of those places, uh, Kenya, right? And the other bit is that it's quite a strategic region for a number of reasons. For one, as we know, um, it's a major, major point of sort of international shipping and maritime. Um, and if you've been following the news, uh, you end up had a lot of uh, activity around some some parts of that region. Um, the other bit is that it's a region that is changing profound ways, 
Um, so we're talking about a region that has 600 plus million people, um, highly diverse marine systems, but also highly diverse political, social, economic systems. Right? That's important to remember. Uh, because as you're going to see, this kind of dynamics uh, play a role, a critical role when you start to think about how do we shape governance um, in response to risk of the collapse of ecosystems and political uh, structures as well. Um, and so I'm going to start here with a bit of a interesting bit of doomsday kind of scenario. So there are three key dynamics that are particularly important when it comes to us thinking about the risk of collapse in a region like this. And why this is important, not just from a regional perspective, all well, this is Africa, but also in terms of how we think about global responses to risks of a system collapse. So the first bit is uh, quite a seminal um, study, extensive seminal study that was done uh, a few years ago. And it basically uh, demonstrated just how vulnerable the coral ecosystems within this vast region are when it comes to collapse, right? When it comes to thinking about collapse. And so the key thing there was not just that there was vulnerability when it comes to you know the collapse of these key some foundational um, ecosystems. But that this was happening within a very compressed time frame, 50 years, you know. It's not a long time ago. It's not a long time uh, to come. And so that stuff gets us to think, you know, when you think about existing collapse, you know, it's not a time horizon that is quite distant or a scenario that is uh, abstract, you know. It starts to bring it home. 50 years is not a long time from now, right? And so when this study came out, um, it didn't get a lot of attention, surprisingly, uh, global attention. But it was a massive study because it was also done uh, using the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCNs. They have this framework that sort of globalizes the analysis of uh, the risk and vulnerability of uh, marine ecosystems. So they, had, they used this framework to kind of analyze uh, the Western Indian Ocean region and as a sort of, let's say, template, if you like, um, that could be then used to analyze other marine ecosystems, uh, not shared by the region, et cetera. So when this study came out, it was pretty profound because we're talking about ecosystem collapse within the time scales uh, that are quite short. Then, there's a second dynamic that is occurs simultaneously. And that is transformational demographic change, right? Now, you know, it's well known that, that Africa is expected to experience a sort of population boom. Majority of the population in Africa is youthful. Um, but then when you start to look into it, you start to realize quite profound uh, sort of aspects of this boom. So number one, of course, this boom is going to take place over a very short period of time. It's going to be rapid, right? And the second point is that a majority, when you look at the distribution within the continent, right? Well, not a majority, about half um, of that concentration of that boom is going to be within the same region that you're talking about that is threatened by existing collapse, right? So that adds another dimension in terms of the pressures that are expected to occur on the marine ecosystem that we're talking about. And you've got to remember also that um, this boom is not just, it is going to occur across the century. So it's a continuous phenomenon pretty much, right? And then there's a third dynamic related to the second and the first. And that is the developmental imperative, right? There's a strong focus because of the state of the continent when we think about development. There's a strong focus to accelerate the developmental imperative. 
which includes increasing reliance on the blue contribution made by the blue economy. So the very marine ecosystem that is threatened with the collapse over the next 50 years, right? And if you look at uh, the policy um, documents that have been designed, um, the Agenda 2063, this is the flagship blueprint uh, for sort of shaping the controls of African de Africa's development. Um, it's a long-term developmental planning process. Um, the first of its sign when you consider all the other continents, really. Um, and we have the Africa Blue Economy Strategy, and all these strategies that have been created are supposed to be implemented within the same time frame. That the ecosystem is expected to collapse. That is um, expected to see this sort of demographic boom. So we have this compressed pressure, urgency, to realize this massive economic uh, sort of goals, aspirations, etc. Um, to cater to this burgeoning population um, with an ecosystem that is certain to collapse. It's a very good policy problem to have, and I do not wish to be a policy maker. Thank goodness I'm not. Right. And so these kind of dynamics start to inspire questions, right? And um, myself with uh, Dr. Ken and a few other colleagues um, was sort of caught up with this conundrum, right? Of how do we then start to think about climate constraints, right? Um, ecological constraints, uh, and the pressure of uh, development within this sort of changing demographic dynamic. Um, I start to ask questions about how do we then pursue the right to development? Because this is a clearly, this is where the political priority is. And it's, you know, um, a lot of questions that we st sort of started asking, thinking that we're going to get an answer to. Um, but we ended up asking more questions, so we didn't ask, answer anything. I wish we did, but we did. But just good questions, though, at the end of the book, <laughs> right? Um, again, I do not wish to be a policymaker right now. Um, but for the purposes of our conversation today, um, the intersection of these three dynamics, it's kind of like a three master here, really. Um, the intersection of these three dynamics presents new questions on how not just we govern systems, and particularly in this case, uh, marine ecological system, but also what kind of institutional questions we ask when we start to design governments for the future. Right? In a scenario where uh, collapse is not just, uh, and I, it's not just ecosystem like collapse because we're also talking about very dependent uh, socio-economic systems. So there's a high risk of political collapse as well. And so how do you start to design governance with these kind of scenarios, not abstracted away, but brought forward in real time, um, you know, within the lifespans of generations that we have today, for example, right? And the key, one of the key points to remember here is that we often talk about, especially in the context of ecology, conservation, et cetera, and sociological governments. Um, we also focus on the ecological aspect of it. But the dynamics of the region that uh, we're focusing on, the Western Indian Ocean uh, region, bring to question the idea of the human uh, so the social systems, the human component of it, and the fragility of those systems to collapse. And if you've been following the continent, uh, events in the continent over the last five years or so uh, across the Sahel, you start to see what that picture kind of looks like, right? Where you have this highly fragile social political systems um, that, when stressed enough, start to break down, right? So into political dysfunction, civil war, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you can't, of course, expect uh, to have effective uh, ecosystem governance with those kind of dynamics. It just becomes an accelerating stressor. And so this kind of interplay uh, forces us to think differently about how to govern 
um, marine sociological systems um, in particular, with the question of uh, managing catastrophic risks of collapse. Right? And how do we design the kind of legal uh, mechanisms or governance arrangements that would facilitate us uh, to either account for or address risks of collapse. Um, and so there are three key characteristics um, that emerge um, when it comes to sort of problematizing this scenario, this picture that we've painted. So the first is, of course, interconnected risks, right? There's a complexity of risks. Um, and it's not just risk that are occurring at regional level, the risk that cascades to national and subnational level, right? Um, and this presents different questions across scales. Second is compressed time. So, like we said, we're not talking about something that is abstract and defined to the future. We're talking about 50 year time scales, 30 year time scales, 20 year time scales, right? And the third is scalar dynamics, in the sense that these risks do not manifest uniformly across the region, right? So if you're going, if you're in Kenya, for example, this risk can manifest in a different way. If you're in Mozambique, which is a far more fragile state with different dynamics going on, it will manifest in different ways. So then, but here's the thing: governing this risk requires some sort of regional cooperation. So how do you then begin to navigate these different dynamics, right? Because no single country can be able to address them by themselves because of their capacity and so. Right. So these key sort of characteristics, of course, we can talk about others, but for the purposes of thinking about how do we problematize this, this is kind of, kind of paint a picture of how we should think or how we start to think about governance. Um, and in terms of the problem structure that we're trying to address and the kind of governance responses that flow out of uh, problems of this kind, right? Um, so whether it's West Indian Ocean, whether it's Caribbean, whatever it is, if we are faced with the kind of problems that have this kind of dynamics, how can we start thinking about it, right? And so um, this kind of leads us to look at, okay, so what kind of governance structures do we have um, presently now? They're quite diverse, right? Um, across scales, you know, we have and uh, sectors as well. So we have um, the climate regime, uh, for example, Paris Agreement and its sort of constituent uh, mechanisms like uh, national con uh, internal contributions, etc. Um, last uh, this last year, um, there was the High Seas Treaty that was concluded, right? So we have this new regime to protect biodiversity in the high sea uh, that was done recently. Um, the biodiversity framework as well, you know, so there's a lot of attention on trying to secure or protect marine ecosystems within this sort of broader corpus of global environmental governance. Um, at regional level, of course, and this is where I also interact with quite a lot, um, there's a convention that is designed to govern the marine ecosystem of that entire region. It's called the Nairobi Convention. Um, so it brings up these 10 states together, kind of the way we, we do the global climate regime. They have their conference of parties and they make decisions uh, under a set of conventions, etc. Right? And then, of course, at national level, because we're talking about national territories, national laws, policies, uh, climate strategies, etc. However, the thing that stands out is that when it comes to addressing the risk of collapse, these governance uh, frameworks um, hardly do so. And if they do, they do it as a sort of uh, peripheral thing under the sort of set of disaster risk. So we'll wait for something to happen and then we can activate, you know, uh, sort of disaster, disaster risk response, this kind of thing. They haven't really embedded 
um, within the various sort of structures, this uh, concept of, well, what happens if you have catastrophic like risk of collapse uh, in the next 30 years? What does that mean? So it's still a very, very nascent frontier um, question for governance, which is important because these dynamics that we talked about uh, keep getting, you know, they, 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 they keep occurring. They're not stopping and waiting for governance. So there's a bit of a lag between where governance is and what is actually um, happening. And so, again, back to that point, uh, the, the, the lag is uh, sort of accelerated or amplified by uh, a few features. Um, that are not new when it comes to governing the you know, sociological system, whether it's marine or climate or things like that. So institutional inertia, which is basically uh, where institutions lag behind or they're very slow to respond to uh, sociological problems. It's climate, you see it in climate, you see it in biodiversity, you see it in plastics. Um, you can pick any sector that has sort of these malign issues. You tend to have governance sort of lagging behind and it's very difficult to get governance to get up to speed uh, just because nature of the problem political dynamics within the different governance systems etc um the second point is uncertainty of taking any action um so governments um and institutions are you talking about uh, global institutions united nations etc or regional um, they don't like taking actions that are sort of highly uncertain, high risk. Uh, you cannot guarantee the outcome. There's a political imperative for that question. Um, these are sort of the risk of social upheaval, et cetera. So um, we like to take decisions on things that are fairly certain and can control. So if we're talking about highly um, risky, if you like, uh, decisions, then there's that reluctance uh, to sort of um, avail governance tools, if you like, to, to address uh, problems that are char characterized by high degrees of uncertainty. And the third bit is the complex tapestry of interests. So here we're talking about different um, interests actors, different interest profiles. So some of it is national interest, some of it is uh, companies and corporate interests. So all these things, great power interests, are a mixed thing in the sort of governance dynamic when it comes to dealing with marine socio-ecological systems um, and how to address uh, risks of collapse or just generally to address stress of stream marine uh, ecological systems. Uh, and this is true also in the climate space. We talk about different interests having uh, influence on whether or not governance proceeds, how it does, uh, how it proceeds, et cetera. And, and the key thing here is also that these interests are spread across space and time. So uh, a, a good point is that we're, we're dealing with 10 different countries, right? Um, some of these countries have interests that are immediate, right? So, for example, if you're dealing with a country that has a, like Somalia or Mozambique, where you have fragile states, their interests are pretty close, right? We want stability, we want security, we want economics, we want it tomorrow. Yeah. Um, there are some which will have a bit of a longer term horizon, right? Um, there are some which will have a different composition, because some want economics, some want ecological. Uh, sort of protection or conservation or things like that, especially the smaller states compared to the larger economies in the region, um, which might have a completely different uh, set of priorities. And we have to account for these priorities when it comes to negotiating. How then do you design governance to respond to this issue? The, 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 the complexity of, of, of responding to risk of collapse, uh, sort of ecological and sort of sociopolitical level, gets compounded by this sort of uh, 
governance dynamic that uh, plays out whenever you're dealing with complex problems or problems that are fairly malign. Um, and collapse of marine research ecological system is definitely one of those things. And so that leads us to ask the question, okay, if we're going to account for um, the risk of collapse of the ecological and political system, should we start to think differently? Taking into account the sort of diverse actors, interests, power differentials, etc., priorities, national priorities, regional priorities, global pressure. Um, and how should we start to think about this? Or can we go on the sort of techno managerial route where we find tweaks to existing regimes and try to see if they're effective or not? You know, should we should increase effectiveness. So, um, we should uh, increase stringency so that uh, implementation is guaranteed and things like that. And this is where um, there's a sort of slight departure from how we think of not just governance within the marine uh, environmental governance side, but just generally when it comes to considering questions of um, catastrophic risks of collapse. Because now we have to start considering the political antecedent to institutional development. What that means is we need to ask how is the issue being problematized from a political perspective, right? What is because the, the, the issues that you're trying to deal with have a political um, sort of touch to them, right? They, they have a political uh, implications, right? And the actors that you're calling on to design governments uh, and design these institutions are political actors. So at the end of the day, the considerations that are going to be key, um, not the only one, but key, are political questions as well, right? What does this risk mean if I'm a policymaker in Mozambique or Madagascar or a French policymaker, right? Um, particularly in those kind of Godzilla-like uh, dynamics. In fact, it's not Godzilla, it's Godzilla, King Kong, and Baby King Kong. And you're not know, trying to give me all of it, right? And this is key because the kind of institutional tools that will emerge out of that negotiation process are going to be shaped by the political construction of this issue. Right? And the second kind of strand to that is now when you talk about the institutional tools, the very sort of discrete institutional tools that can we, we can then make available um, within and outside of this negotiation process to sort of give a, a sort of effectiveness to that problematization and the kind of responses that come out of that sort of negotiation, if I can put it that way. And so we tend to focus a lot on the sort of the technical bits. So uh, we need more reflexivity in governments. You know, we need to increase adaptation, the adaptive capacity. Um, let's incorporate foresight analysis and, and the reflexivity. The, this kind of harnessing the governance across scales. Should we experiment polycentric? This kind of things. But the key here is that those tools are kind of sort of de uh, derived out of, or implemented within this sort of broader political construct, right? Because how, uh, how um, an issue problematized by those very actors determines whether or not they're going to, uh, first of all, prioritize the issue. Second of all, what kind of tools that they want? Are they going to go for a more sort of uh, coordinated coordination style form of governance? And they're going to privilege more stringency with uh, the use of uh, uh, with the sanction regimes or uh, adjudication regimes, etc. And how are they going to implement the, um, the institutional frameworks that they design, if at all they're going to do so? Uh, so effectiveness is also a factor to consider. And so taking together, we have the tools, 
and you have the political understanding of the political construction of the problem. And if you put those two together, then you can start to ask, what does um, ecosystem and uh, socio-political risk of collapse look like within this context? How is it problematic? And this is particularly important because then it forces us to not abstract away from, um, from, from, from the political realities, the context um, of the regions that we're dealing with. And sort of universalize as much as it's good to have the sort of global consensus that we need to address these concerns. Um, one of the things that tends to hinder effectiveness is that when it starts to trickle down, then we, we, we encounter these realities that influence not just how governance is implemented, but also the effectiveness of such implementation. And um, this, to kind of bring that home, right? Um, into now what I actually do is that um, so one of the things I do is I work with the Nairobi Convention, like I mentioned, it's this regional sort of um, association of regional body of states of 10 uh, countries that I mentioned. And we're trying to see how we can translate this sort of conceptual thinking into actual uh, regime design or design design. And this year, in fact, in two months, yes, um, there's going to be the 11th session, this is the 10th session, the 11th session of the Conference of Parties. And one of the things that is on the table as a pre critical agenda is to design a sort of early warning system, um, sort of mechanism, and embed it into broad decision making on how the region is governed in terms of marine ecosystem governance. You know, how do we boost the incentivize states to invest in monitoring? Um, how do we translate that into real time decision making? How do we incorporate flexibility in government? These are the questions that are going to be discussed in there. Um, and I'm involved in writing a white paper specifically to frame those questions within the broader focus of sort of um, global catastrophic risk thinking, right? And as, an, as a sort of institutional experiment that can then be used to inspire um, other regions to think of this kind of uh, questions and, and how they, they construct them. Right? And this is important because um, it, it links to another sort of very relevant framework right, that is happening. Again, the same region. Remember, we talked about developmental empire. And um, the African Union Development Agency, which is the sort of the lead agency mandated to spearhead and inspire the uh, sort of accelerating development in the region, um, is on the cusp of implementing what it calls its second decade of implementation of the Agenda 2063, which is the blueprint, continental blueprint up to 2063 to achieve rapid economic uh, development, right? And they have the goals that have been set, they call them moonshots on what their priorities are. These implicate the same countries that we are talking about, right? And so they've set their priorities. We want to implement this and it's sort of a decade of accelerated implementation, right? So they have the moonshots and within that sort of uh, mechanism. They have a, a policy bridge type that was launched in January this year, which I'm part of, right, to sort of create a sort of intellectual underpinnings for um, realizing this goal within the next 10 years. Right? So again, we're seeing the sort of attempt to balance, this attempt to balance the sort of developmental imperative with this sort of uh, ecological conservation, ecosystem conservation environment, right? Um, but they're struggling with it. But this, what is clear to me is that this institutional experimentation that is happening to try and think through these questions, uh, which is, is, is highly, highly encouraged by our answer. And the third bit, which is, again, linked there too, is, of course, we have the 
UNFCCC uh, for that, the climate talks that are scheduled to happen in this year. And this is important because um, we're going to see the second generation of uh, national retirement contributions, which is national policies, uh, where countries say we're going to take climate action in this way, this way, this set out the climate uh, action priorities and goals to try and meet some of the sort of global targets and uh, uh, priorities that have been set when it comes to taking climate action. Right? And why is that important in the context of what we're talking about is because a key sort of link when it comes to regional governance is the sort of the national policies related to climate change, right? Uh, are being used also uh, and highly important when it comes to managing the sort of marine sustainable ecosystem uh, in the Western Indian Ocean. Yeah. So those three sort of broad realms are highly interconnected and they are being used to kind of think through what kind of uh, governance responses, what kind of, uh, how kind of articulating their priorities within uh, this highly important complex, you know, one could say, uh, dynamics, set of dynamics, uh, and how they respond to some of the questions to do with uh, early monitoring, warning, risk management, etc. And so this presents an important opportunity because now we get to translate what is sort of theoretical intellectual into real-time institutional design. And there are no answers as to what kind of form some of these uh, institutions are going to take. I, I cannot answer that. But what we do know is that we are in the process of active experimentation, right? Um, to try and see how can we start to forge um, institutions that are able to at least anticipate and account for uh, some of these really, really pressing risks that we are talking about. Right. And so I guess the key takeaway here is that um, a couple of things. So one, when it comes to thinking of risk, particularly in the context of you know, the marine research ecological systems, in a region as vast as the West Indian Ocean. Um, we're talking about a risk within a fairly, fairly uh, compressed time frame, and that changes how we perceive it. And also, it changes how we think about the role of context um, and, and how it shapes governance, right? Uh, problematization and eventual governance um, of, of, of such kind of uh, uh, risk. And also, um, this active experimentation happening, um, it might not be perfect, we are yet to know whether it's going to be successful or not, but it is happening to try and respond to these challenges, not because they thought 10 years ago that we're going to have this, we're going to experiment, no, but it's because of the evolving reality that are forcing this kind of uh, experimentation to take place. And so, it forces us to think of what are other instances uh, where we can expand our horizon and start to think about uh, sources of institutional uh, experimentation that are happening um, and how those experimentation uh, avenues, experimentation sites, uh, problematize this kind of issues um, and give us a fuller picture on how to think about global catastrophic risk. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Robin, and uh, for such an kind of um, interesting presentation. And I'll take the prerogative of the chair just to give a 30 second summary of my key takeaways. And I think it's very interesting uh, that you kind of uh, Starting with uh, giving us um, a teaser of how law could deal with these kind of problems, but also highlighting uh, most important when we think about collapse, whether uh, it's of ecosystems or kind of other kinds of collapse, including political collapse, we should think about very long time horizons or scenarios that are quite uh, plausible. 
But then you see in this case, these are finally kind of playing out. And the time is very, very short. And also think about the takeaway also from the presentation is um, thinking about a problem, but then also trying to find uh, out how we could build institutions that kind of would respond to that kind of problem. But it also left us without uh, answers, which we were waiting for answers, uh, but it seems uh, very good. But really mm -hmm. very simple answers. So uh, in this session now, we'll open up for Q&A, where I could press Ruben for more questions, uh, but also kind of share quick reflections. So we have colleagues online. So if there are any questions online, please uh, pop in the chat box. Uh, but also in here, if you have a question, please put up your hand, and then we'll take a couple of um, questions for your uh, 10 minutes. That's more than enough for mm. round of questions. So introduce yourself, and then kind of ask a question, and maybe we'll take three or four questions. Yes, yes. <coughs> so what yeah. we've now, yeah. very interesting, particularly as I've worked in the past in the Indian Ocean. But um, in terms of um, the future at the moment, or in the future, to what extent do you think international law, and I'm thinking here of own class, mm. is too weak? Mm. And to what extent does international law interface with domestic law, particularly in, in the Western Indian Ocean, East African states, and in a different way that the island states, which are going to be very differently affected by mm. climate change, thinking obviously Comoros and mm. Madagascar, Seychelles, mm. Mauritius. Mm. That's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, Would you like us to take maybe two more and then? No, sure. Yes. Are there any more questions? So, so on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so my question, I guess, is about the uh, uh, weakness of the use of uh, climate part of this framework. Mm. Because uh, I have the uh, current international government's regime working climate is based on national determined contributions and kind of following up from the question for Colin. It's uh, in many cases, uh, when you look at the problem of bi-system collapse, the uh, you know, Western Indian Ocean mm -hmm. it is uh, extraterritorial. So it mm -hmm. kind of happens outside the territories of most of the countries, with the exception possibly of taxation and some other state. So uh, basically, is it enough to use the current time down? So should we increase uh, or improve in some way? In which way should we improve the uh, regime for it to be uh, basically detected in health and health issues, mm. which are not bound by the national boundaries. Mm. Great. Mm. Uh, any other question? No. Yes, Dan. Okay. Yes, yeah, so my question is to do with uh, COPs, um, both, both the Nairobi Convention and, and the climate COP that we know about. Um, there's many questions as to whether they're fit for purpose, and my question to Ruben would be, um, mm. is the COP designed around the Nairobi Convention is it fit for purpose? And because I've heard of um, proposals to merge uh, the biodiversity COP with the climate COP, and I wonder if that's constructive or whether that would um, dilute its significance. Mm. Great. So, Ruben, if you okay. give us a quick uh, answer yeah. to that round of questions, and then we we'll open for a second round. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for those questions. They're pretty good questions. Um, to what extent does international law kind of interface the sort of domestic law and, and the kind of dynamics within that interaction? I uh, hope I'm capturing the gist of the question correctly. Um, you're right to to say that, uh, particularly when it comes to addressing issues like this, international law is a really limited as to the extent, you know. Part of it is because international some of this law, like you clause you're talking about, Construction in the 80s, coming into force in the 90s, and things like that. So there, there's that time difference, right? Um, but also, we know international law um, has a major uh, problem when it comes to enforcement, yeah, particularly when it comes to issues like this. And this is true for the climate regime, this is true for, for most of the other regimes. Um, but what has happened here is that. Whereas we have the international law kind of setting the overarching sort of uh, direction, if you like, guidance, right? There's a lot of reliance on regional and domestic 
And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first one has to do with the, sort of the interpretation, because it's really talking about political construction, of some of those goals and um, captured at the international level, right? To reflect some of the priorities at regional level, which makes it easier to get political by. And the second bit is that uh, it makes it easier to also translate some of these things and, and let's say goals, principles captured at the international level at domestic, right? Um, and some of this has to do with just the realities of the political dynamics of the region, because uh, we're talking about a region that places a lot of emphasis on sort of the regional economic uh, governance blocks. So they have this, like the East African community, the Southern African, they have these blocks, right? And they have a lot of political parties. And so to try and sort of align different governments of different issues is that sort of tendency to and lead towards regional governments. But um, insofar as using domestic law to try and sort of, I guess, enforce international law, for example, and particularly on issues like this, there's still some way to go as to figure out how exactly do you go about doing so, right? Because one of the things that has managed is, um, a, in this country is kind of just Turn around and say, okay, we're going to enforce national law. Except in situations where it's very clear, for example, like we should think of that. Let's see, you can over the like, cross boundary disputes, stuff like that. It's fairly easy to lean on international law and try to put just in case of that. But when it comes to highly complex issues like this, where you have different forces pulling in different directions, it becomes a little bit tricky to um, eschew domestic and regional and go straight to international, right? Because it's that gap of relevance and connectivity. However, um, there's a role that the regional and domestic are playing insofar as at least getting as much as possible to meet some of the goals in particular not of some of the uh, priorities set up in the national level. So international law plays that role as sort of depending on the specific context, but it tends to play that sort of role as a focal point, right? Around which uh, regional uh, and domestic governance of the international uh, is uh, is set. So you find some of the principles being translated at domestic and international level, and they are limited uh, for civil and things like that. Great. So we before we proceed to the next two questions. So of course, it's time that we should relate and have three minutes to go. So I think I'd ask for five more minutes from you if it's fine, and also five more minutes from our audience if it's fine. But that means I all the pressure for Google. <laughs> so could you fire through the two questions and then we open up one round of questions and there's a question online. And then from there, you can take up the conversation. So, more pressure to you. Sure, there's no risk of collapse. <laughs> um, so, the second question um, of reliance on the climate regime. Um, you're right. As a single regime, the climate regime is inadequate. You're absolutely right. And in fact, in the region, one of the things that is clearly apparent is the sort of lack of accounting for this kind of scenarios. You know? And part of that is due to just the sheer the context and capacity, for example, you need to get data to then translate this data into policy and things like that. And but some of it is just because it's not a question that is thought. Right? It, it's quite uh, different, you know. We have we're dealing with the system, but we don't really think of what happens if collapse actually should start thinking about. It's a fairly different conceptual shape. Right? And, and so, but the other thing that's happening is that there's a sort of cross linkage between private government, development government, uh, they tend to speak to each other a lot. It's a sort of regime interaction, kind of, you know, and even amongst the decision making body, the policy maker, et cetera, and, and uh, from the intellectual side, you know, the, the people who are thinking about this and trying to intellectualize this problem, there's that. Um, incentive to start to cross-link this thing. 
because the political priority is the health. But then uh, there's this need then to address climate, to address the sustainable right? So it forces that interaction, you know, in forms that as some of it is still not clear institutionalized because it's not so strict regime um, interaction yet. But at a political level, there's a lot of that value going on. A lot of decisions that reflect this um, principle. So it opens up the avenue to involve this regime, involve that regime, right? But it's still a, a process of experimentation because, again, there's a challenge of implementation, for example. So you're right, um, the climate regime is probably not like going to actually be dealing with this on its own, right? And the issues are quite true. Um, a lot of these countries don't even have control over their national marine territory. So it raises a big, big gap as to how they do design them with those kind of priorities in place. Um, fit for purpose. I think when it comes to thinking about a collapse, I would say as it is now, but it doesn't uh, the way the institutions are, are, are constructed, there's still a long way to go to just, uh, first of all, even align the institutions to the issues that we're facing and then start to figure out uh, the, how do you then manage the complexities of the different institutions that are invoked across different scales to just try and deal with this. Because uh, back to the point that I made earlier, none of these institutions by themselves are even um, are yet to fully account for this kind of scenarios so or this kind of risk that are occurring in real time. So in terms of fit, the short answer is no, they're not fit. <laughs> they're not fit for purpose just yet. Um, but then that is forcing a different way of thinking. Should we think about, okay, can we make tweaks, techno managerial tweaks to increase fitness, let's add a bit of adaptation, adaptive flexibility. Then how do you do that? What does that look like? And then you have different countries coming in and saying, hey, listen, I don't like this. I, I think of it this way. Then it becomes a political discussion. What do you mean by fitness? What do you mean by et cetera? Right? Which is why one of the things that's happening is to flip the thinking around and say, OK, what is the political construction of this issue? And then how do we then proceed to either reform or create new institutions that reflect this kind of political construction of the problems, right? Um, that's not to say that uh, it's all things that we don't come for the ecological or scientific component of it. But it's to recognize that designing institutions is inherently a political process. Okay. okay, so thanks, Ruben. So now we have two minutes <laughs> uh, into the allocated time that we generously gave us. So I think we just take the round of questions very quickly, and then Ruben will give a choice answer, a sentence each as you round out, and then we kind of close up. So the part yeah. question online is going to be difficult when I say, thank you for a very interesting presentation. In the context of an exploding population, a reduction in supply across markets and increasing scale. Is there a role for new types of localized governance using any of those jobs or multiple approaches to governance succession? So maybe we'll just take kind of a just question that is complex and then we'll be able to give us two sentences to synthesize yep. and then kind of close. Because, uh, yeah. Yes, please. And then a different question but for you, the time. Uh, are you hopeful that this will work? So, yes. Great. So, so here's okay. So maybe we have two to three sentences, and then for those who are here, Ruben is available, you can chat more. For those who are online, Ruben's email. Yeah, it's very prolific on Twitter, we get in touch. So give us two to three sentences, and please give us a hopeful uh, kind of take up. Because that would you guys have any? I'm hopeful we are trying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hopeful we are trying. Um, whether it's going to work is a very difficult thing to say. I personally am pragmatically hopeful that we are trying to do something, and that's the best we can do. Right? That's something. Okay. Yeah, I think you're doing something. Um, new types of governance. Yes, 
which is the whole point about experimentation and one of the things of experimenting like Ostrom's idea of polycentricity and um, how to you know what that means and how that uh, manifests and the risks uh, associated with sort of such kind of complex governance so yes um, particularly because we're dealing with new types of problems that require harnessing of different uh, scales and different actors and different sites of governance and institutions as well. So yes, uh, there's definitely uh, a role for that and that's what we are trying to do also in sort of thinking about noble catastrophic risks and how we can apply this thinking into a region such as this.